If you are reared with a 20th century, or shall we say an early 20th century common sense, which is based on the philosophy of science of the 19th century, uh, you regard yourself as an accident, a biological accident, in a stupid universe, which is mechanical, but has no feelings. A vast, pointless gyration of radioactive rocks and gas in which uh, you happen to occur. Of course, if you don't have that point of view and you are more traditional, you look upon yourself as a child of God. And therefore, under authority. In other words, there's a big boss on top of all this. And uh, you better watch your P's and Q's because that Almighty is looking after you with the attitude of this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And when you look at the world in that image or in the other image that it's a stupid mechanism, either point of view you take, uh, you don't really belong. You are not really part of all this. Uh, or to put it in the strongest possible way, it is quite alien to our thought that the external world, which is defined as something that happens to you, and your body itself as something that you got caught up with, it is quite alien to consider all that as you yourself. Because, you see, we have such a myopic view of what one's self is.
Now, we come here to an extremely important principle, which is the different points of view you get when you change your level of magnification. That is to say, you can look at something with a microscope and see it a certain way. You can look at it with a naked eye and see it in a certain way. You look at it with a telescope and you see it in another way. Now, which level of magnification is the correct one? Well, obviously, uh, they're all correct. They're just different points of view. When we examine our bloodstreams under a microscope, we see there's one hell of a fight going on. All sorts of microorganisms are chewing each other up. And if we got overly fascinated with our view of our own bloodstreams in the microscope, we should start taking sides, which would be fatal, because the health of our organism depends on the continuance of this battle. What is, in other words, conflict at one level of magnification is harmony at a higher level. Now, could it possibly be, therefore, that we, with all our problems, conflicts, neuroses, sicknesses, political outrages, wars, tortures, and everything that goes on in human life, are a state of conflict which can be seen in a larger perspective as a situation of harmony? And you can say, aha, at last I see, I got the point. I've seen how all this makes sense. But what this insight depended upon was your overcoming the illusion that space separates things. That is to say, the space, the interval between your body and mine. The uh, interval created by birth at one end and death at the other. And then after somebody's death, then somebody else's birth. 
uh, these are events with intervals between them. And normally we regard these intervals in time, and these intervals in space, as having no importance, no function. We tend to see the universe itself as really consisting in all the stars and galaxies. That's what it is, that's what we notice. But the space in which all this happens is sort of written off as something that isn't really there. But what one has to realize is that the space is an essential function of the things in the space. After all, you can't have separate stars unless there is a space around. Eliminate the space and you will see you couldn't have this phenomenon at all. And vice versa. You couldn't have the space. They wouldn't be there in any sense whatsoever if there weren't the bodies in it. So the bodies in the space and the space are two aspects of a single continuum. They're related together in exactly the same way as a back and a front. And you just don't get one without the other. So the moment you see that intervals, that space is connective, you can understand uh, at once how you are not just to be exclusively defined as a flash of consciousness that occurs between two eternal darknesses. You consider that in the darkness that comes before your birth, there was no you, and in the eternal darkness that follows your death, there is likewise no you. And I'm going to discuss these matters not by appealing to any special spooky knowledge, as if I had been traveling on the higher planes and knew all my previous incarnations and therefore could tell you authoritatively that. Uh, 
you are much more than this individuality. I'm going to do it on a basis of complete common sense that everybody has access to the facts. Life is a pattern of immense complexity. And what you call yourself as a living organism, say, I am my whole body at the very least. Now, what is that body? That body is recognizable, and I recognize my friends when I meet them again, and you recognize me. Uh, although the last time any of you saw me, I was absolutely something entirely different from what I am now just as the flame of a candle is never a constant. A flame of a candle is a stream of hot gas. Only you say the flame of the candle as if it were a constant. Well, it is a recognizably constant pattern, but in exactly the same way, we are all constant patterns. And that's all we are. The only thing constant about us at all is the doing rather than the being. It's the way we behave, the way we dance, only there's no we that dances, there's just the dancing. There is no thing that whirlpools. There is the whirlpool, and in the same way, each one of us is a very, very delightfully complex undulation of the energy of the whole universe.
Because life is basically a game of hide and seek. Because life is pulsation. On and off. Here it is and now it isn't. And by being this pulsation, we know it's there. Now from those very tiny fast rhythms, which give us the impression of continuity, there are also in this universe immensely slow rhythms. And these are very difficult for us to keep track of and they impress us and depress us as our own life and death, as our coming and going, which goes for what is uh, to us such a slow pace that we can't possibly believe uh, that it is really a rhythm. We think of it uh, as our birth, as something quite unique that uh, could never occur again because we're so close to it, you see, and it's moving so slowly.
process of growth, the, the basic process of biology, is one in which lower orders are always being superseded by higher orders. But the lower order can never figure out, or only very rarely figure out, what the higher order is that's taking over. And may see it as a terrible threat, as total disaster, as the very end. But can never be aware that the principle of growth always has and always will continue. Because that's what's going on. But you never know what the next step is going to be. Because if you did know, you wouldn't take it. Because it would already be past. Do you understand this? That any certainly known future is an event of which we can say, you've had it. And in that sense, it's past. When we play a game, the outcome of the game becomes certain. We at that point cancel the game and begin a new one. Because the whole zest of the thing, which takes me back to the idea that this whole thing is a hide-and-seek game, is that you don't know what the next order coming up is. We have this uh, rather myopic way of looking at things. And we screen out from attention uh, anything that is not immediately important to a scanning system based on sensing danger. But quite obviously, you as a complete individual are much more than the scanning system. You are in uh, relationships with the external world that on the whole are incredibly harmonious. The energies of life in the form of temperature, light, air and food and so on 
are streaming through you all at this moment in the most magnificently harmonious way. When anything is constant, it says, okay, that's safe, it's in the bag. You needn't pay attention to that anymore. And therefore, we eliminate systematically from our awareness all the gorgeous things that are going on all the time and instead only become focused on the things, the troublesome things that might happen to upset it. Which is all right, but we make too much of it. We make so much of it that we identify our very selves, I, ego, with the radar, with the troubleshooter. And that's only a tiny fragment of one's total being. very soon realize that your existence is not something that is just the uh, hopeless little creature that's suddenly confronted with a great big external world that goes Gah! at him you know, and eats him up. Every tiniest little thing that comes into being, every minute little fruit fly or gnat or bacterium I will go so far as to say is an event upon which this whole cosmos depends. This thing goes both ways. It's not only that every little organism which exists depends on its total environment. The reverse is also true, that the total environment depends on each and every one of those little organisms. So that you could say this universe consists of a, an arrangement of pattern in which every event is essential to the whole thing. Now, 
we screen that idea out of our consciousness in exactly the same way that we screen out the perception of space as an important reality. Just as we pay attention to the figure and ignore the background, so we see one way of looking at things, mainly that the organism is very frail against the environment. It lasts a long time, the environment, but the organism only lasts a short time. What do you mean the environment lasts a long time? What does the environment consist of? Just a lot of little things. When you get far enough away from all the organisms and the little bits of things, you see the environment in another scale of magnification. But actually, uh, the whole thing is arranged in a, a polar system where the enormous depends on the tiny and the tiny depends on the enormous. And you get a relationship between these extremes which can be called a transaction. They always go together. So in this way, we are always, as it were, overemphasizing a certain aspect of our experience. We say now, what is important about people? Is there a unique individuality? And we have been given an immense psychic investment in our own individuality by our upbringing. What are you going to amount? What are you going to contribute to human life? What's your particular destiny going to be? It's a fine idea. But the thing we don't understand that it won't work, this great idea, without being balanced with its opposite. Just as you can't have the back without the front. So you cannot have the values of a unique personality unless at the same time everybody recognizes that uh, there is another level at which we are not unique at all, but that I am you and you are I. You see, every one of you feels that you're the center of the universe and that everything else is happening around you in a circle. You can turn around 
and uh, you can see sort of equally far in all directions, especially if you're in a ship in the middle of the ocean. So you're in the middle. And it's true from the standpoint of astronomy. We live in a curved space-time continuum, that is to say in a universe at which every point may be regarded as the center. Consider a sphere. Here's a ball. What point on this ball is the center of its surface? You can see at once that any point can be the center of its surface. So legitimately, all points in the universe are the center. We are all like the nerve ends 
on your own skin. See, at every point on your skin, there's a little nerve end going peek and getting information from the outside world. Another and another and another, all over. And they all constitute your total sensitivity. Well, so in the same way, when all these people sitting around here, with their little eyes and little ears and things, they're going peek, and they're all really one common center called I, which is looking at itself from ever so many different points of view. Only we are so close to it and we are so absorbed in the different ways each one of them is doing that we neglect the community underneath. But we don't realize, you see, that just as we know how to do this, we know equally well how to turn the sun into light, how to blue the sky, how to blow the wind, how to wave the ocean, how to um, digest food, and um, I might add, to be digested and transformed. Uh, but the um, pattern keeps going, and it's always you. Only you see you have this marvelous capacity to transform yourself without knowing that you're doing it. Therefore, you keep surprising yourself. And therefore, you keep on doing it. Because if you didn't surprise yourself, you wouldn't go on doing it. It's just the very fact, you see, that you seem to be the victims of a thing you don't understand, and that you seem to conclude your life every time in a wipeout called death, where all your control goes, is just exactly that opposite condition to what you call being alive, that allows you to be alive.
One of the first things which everybody should understand is that every creature in the universe that is in any way sensitive and in any manner of speaking conscious regards itself as a human being. That is to say, uh, it knows and is aware of a hierarchy of beings above it and a hierarchy of beings below it. If you take such a tiny creature as a fruit fly, which lives only a few days, it is aware of all sorts of weird little animals and objects and spores floating in the atmosphere, which we don't even notice unless we've got a microscope around. And it criticizes them as being inferior animals and uh, all that sort of thing. Whereas human beings are things that it doesn't comprehend. Uh, they're in, as much outside its uh, intellect as a quasar is outside ours and we see these far-off objects floating in the heavens and we have only the vaguest idea of what they may be but there is I think a fundamental principle that everybody must understand and that is the principle of relativity that is to say that wherever you are and whoever you are and whatever you are you're in the middle that's the game
you stand and you can see a horizon all around you to exactly the same distance, you're in the center of a circle because your senses extend a certain direction in all directions and therefore give you the impression of being in the middle. Now, everything in the world feels like that. And also it has its own kind, which look natural to it. You see uh, spiders and uh, hydras and sea urchins and so on don't look very natural to us. We say, well, I wouldn't want to look like that. But they say when they see us, uh, well, what kind of an awful thing is that? And what a lot of nonsense it does. Because the definition of a person is where you look from. And they, you see, in their situation, feel just as cultured as we can possibly feel. And they have their distinctions and their snobberies, just in the same way that we do. Because, you see, they do, they dig all sorts of things that we don't even notice. Uh, we think a person is cultured because they play the piano or the violin or they read poetry or they have a lot of big library and they have paintings all around and they have a fancy house and so on and we say well there's a person of culture and we can see at once uh, that this is really some rather elegant human being. But when you get down into the world of fishes they have exactly the same thing only Instead of depending on collecting a lot of books and things like that, it is the precise way, the very subtle wiggles of a tail, the little tremors of vibration that makes one fish a very superior fish as compared with other fish. And all the other fish look at that one and say, oh my, to be like that, what a genius. To be able to do just that little extra thing, see? Because they're very sensitive. Even airplanes in formation can't begin to do what birds and fish can do in, in their communal uh, swirling dances that they do.
Here is a very strange thing. That every creature, therefore, which feels that it is human, and which knows that it's there in the same way as you know you're here, experiences being here as constituting a sort of blockage. The sensation of a certain tension which constitutes the feeling of I-ness, of there-ness, of being here. Because after all, every creature is a particular form. Everything is individual. Not only you as a total organism standing here, but all the component cells of your body. Each one of them has some sort of a feeling of its own. And it, it is individual. You can look at a microscope at the right level of magnification and you can see that thing there with its own little life. And if you examine the stream of your blood, you'll find it full of all kinds of organisms that are having all sorts of conspiracies and games and plots and eating each other and doing these things that, like we do. Only uh, we, we realize that we wouldn't be healthy as a total organism unless there were all these wars and fights and plots and politics going on between the various cells in our blood. But from their point of view, you see, they feel uh, a little bit put out because they're being organized.
there is this sensation of a practically every living being of constituting a center of tension and of resistance. That is to say, of being a little bit blocked, or shall I say, of being in the way, being in one's own way. Imagine the opposite. Let us suppose, for example, that you got up in the morning with a feeling of total transparency. There's no resistance in your organism to the external world. You just float through it. You're part of it, it's part of you. And just in the same way, for example, that when you see, if you see well, you aren't aware of your eyes. But if there's something wrong with your eyes, and you see spots in front of you, then you are looking at your eyes, and your eyes are getting in your own way. And so in exactly the same way, the perfect form of man is unaware of himself because he doesn't get in his own way. He is thus, in this sense, completely transparent. Do you know if you study your body and its dynamics, you will find that you are fighting all the time. Most people are, some aren't, but most people are fighting the external world all the time. Very many people are afraid that they will fall apart 
or somehow disintegrate if they don't make efforts to hold themselves together or else that they will be disintegrated by some outside agency if they're not constantly on the alert like this all around you see to protect themselves now i'm not saying you shouldn't do that but i'm inviting you to become immensely aware of the fact that if you do that at all that you do it and that you have therefore the sense of being alone of being a particular separate form that is unlike any other form on earth that's just you and concentrate on that
as you focus on that sensation of distinctness, we'll even call this one separateness, the thing to do with all feelings that you don't like is to experience them as deeply as possible and go into the inmost depths of loneliness and indeed let us say the inmost depths of selfishness because you see the sensation of being you this curious lonely center of awkward sensitivity subject to the most peculiar feelings and pains and anxieties and all that sort of thing all that is an essential prerequisite for feeling something else. These two experiences go together. So what any one or any being whatsoever who has a sense of centrality, who has a sense of selfhood, who has a sense of identity, that sense of identity is inseparable from something else going on that is defined as not being me as not being under my control and that may jump at any time. So, what I want you to understand is that these two sensations, one of being the lonely, central, sensitive, vulnerable self, living in the midst of a world that feels other, but is not under your control, I want to try and show you that these two sensations are really one sensation, or rather two aspects of one sensation. You couldn't have the one experience without the other experience. Now, this is a rather good thing to know. Because it means that you won't panic if you discover this 
people who suffer from chronic anxiety uh, are always in doubt, you see, about this relationship between what I feel as myself and what I feel as something else. Every living being is a manifestation of everything that there is. Crazy. But the thing is that what we do is to try and prevent people from realizing that this is so. By pointing out to them in the most subtle ways their limitations. And seeing if we can phase them make them uncertain, make them unsteady. It's like all sorts of games that you can play where if a person wavers, he loses. But people play that with each other all the time. And the reason they do it is not the reason they think. It is that if everybody were perfectly clear that they were a manifestation of the divine being, nothing very much would happen. But so as to keep everybody a little bit unclear about it, the whole thing uh, bugs itself and creates these little doubts. So what we're beginning with is these little doubts, you see. These sensations of, of blockage, of uh, not being very sure of yourself, but knowing very much indeed that you are yourself and that uh, you're alone and it's all up to you. The terrible feeling of responsibility.
So what I'm trying to point out to you is if you intensify that feeling and bring it to its highest pitch, you will immediately realize that you are aware of it only by virtue of the entire sensation of something else, something defined as not you. So the feeling of not you and the feeling of you are relative. They go together and you can't have the one without the other. And if you can't have the one without the other, that means there's a secret conspiracy between the two. They are really the same, but pretending to be different. Because the whole idea is if there wasn't a difference, you wouldn't know anything was happening. There'd be just yourself echoing back at you, you see. And you'd feel like a madman in a hall of mirrors. Where everything you went was, was just yourself, you see, in all directions, just you. Well, that's no fun. You may think that I'm speaking in favor of some kind of um, schizoid pluralistic universe. No, the whole point is this, that difference and, and every kind of variety of differentiation is the way through which unity is discovered. And the fact that men and women, for example, has a primordial kind of difference, never can really understand each other, is tremendously exciting. Uh, because that's a, a way by which something happens. If it makes a difference, then it's there. If it doesn't make a difference, it doesn't matter. And what doesn't matter doesn't exist. So when you get this extreme sense of your own existence as a rather painful fact in the middle of everything else, the everything else feeling and the you feeling are two poles of one and the same process. So that the real you 
is what lies between these poles and includes both of them. This is one of the oldest ideas in the universe, that the universe is the interplay of difference, and the primordial difference is between up and down, back and front, black and white, is and isn't, male and female, positive and negative. somehow how you surprise yourself for example when you feel your own pulse and you suddenly feel this life going on in you which you're not willing 
You say you have the belly rumbles, and uh, you didn't intend to have the belly rumbles, and suddenly it happened. Is this something you're doing? Or is it merely something that's happening to you, as if it was raining and the rain was happening to you? Consider breathing. Are you breathing, or is it breathing you? Well, you can feel it either way. You can decide to breathe and uh, feel that you're breathing in just the same way that you walk when you want to. On the other hand, when you forget about breathing altogether, it still goes on, and so it seems to be something that happens to you. Which is it? What enables you to make a decision? When you decide, do you first decide to decide, or do you just decide? Now, how do you do that? Nobody knows. You see. Experience ourselves through and through as something that just happens. We look at it this way: if you feel your body, your skin, the solidity of you, and with regard what marvelous eyes you have, which are the power which generate light and color, 
out of all these electrical quanta in the external world. And these ears, these beautiful shells that you wear on the side of your head, with their little spiral bones, the cochlea inside, you know, all that. It's marvelous. But you don't feel responsible for this. You don't know how it's made, if it is made. But it's you. That's what you are. That extraordinary pattern. Thank <laughs> you. 
extraordinary thing is, you see, that this is you. This extraordinary, marvelous arabesque of tubes and bones and cartilage. Myriads of interconnecting electronics and nervous systems and everything wonderful. But you can feel it, all of it, as if it was just happening to you. But if you want to feel it that way, then you've got to go the whole way and you've got to feel that your decisions just happen to you. And that the thing that you call yourself to which things happen is just something that happens. You don't know how you manage to be an ego, how you happen to be conscious. That just happened too. So happenings happen to a happening. When you get that way, that's a very interesting road to run. But you can try the other way. You can extend it and say, now look here. If, 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 if I really am my eyes, although I don't understand them, I mean, let us say I can't describe it in words. This is me. It's an extraordinary thing, but it is. But I don't understand how it happens. But then, you see, that's the whole point. If you will accept the idea that you are your own eyes and your own heart and your own ears with that wonderful spiral cochlea inside and all these amazing gadgets here, you're all that. Now, therefore, by a little extension of the imagination, you can very well see that if all those subtleties inside you feel other than your conscious ego, but nevertheless are one with it, the same argument will go for all the other things going on around you. The sun shining, the stars twinkling, the wind blowing, and the great ocean restlessly pounding against these cliffs. That's you too. You don't control it, of course, because there has to be something about you you don't control or you wouldn't be you. Because to understand the principle of relativity is there's no self without other.
You have to regard yourself as a cloud. Because you see, clouds never make mistakes. Did you ever see a cloud that was misshapen? No, they always do the right thing. Now, so as a matter of fact do we, because we are natural beings just like clouds and waves. Only uh, we have complicated games which cause us to doubt ourselves. But if you will treat yourself for a while as a cloud or wave and realize that you can't make a mistake, whatever you do, because even if you do something that seems to be totally disastrous, it'll all come out in the wash somehow or other. Then, through this capacity, you will develop a kind of confidence. And through confidence, you will be able to trust your own intuition. Only the thing that you have to be careful about, and many people fall into trouble here, is that when they take the attitude that I can't possibly make a mistake, they overdo it. Which shows that they don't really believe it. So a lot of people come on, so you put on the weirdest, filthiest clothes, and you go and steal things, and uh, all kinds of things like that. That's overdoing it. That shows that you haven't learned. You're overcompensating. Because before, you were told to do this, do that, and the other, and watch, and be self-conscious, and nervous, and so on. And so you just go to the other extreme. But this is the middle way of knowing it has nothing to do with your decision to do this or not. Whether you decide that uh, you can't make a mistake or whether you don't decide it, it's true anyway. That you are like cloud and water. And through that realization, without overcompensating in the other direction, you will come to the point where you begin to be on good terms with your own being and to be able to trust your own brain.
everything in the world, knives and forks, tables and chairs, trees and stones, are indescribable. We can't say anything about everything. Because in order to say something about something, and state it logically, you have to be able to put it in a class. Now classes are intellectual boxes. When you play games like animal, vegetable and mineral, you've got there three boxes. And when you come to think of it, you don't know what any two of those boxes are really without the third, or especially you don't know any one without another. Because in order to have a box, there must be what's inside the box and what's outside the box. And then by this method of contrast, we can make a logical discussion about things. But then, when you come to something which is completely all-inclusive, to what fundamentally is, then you are without a box and you can't talk logically. Of course, you can distinguish is from is not. But only in a very limited way, as I can say, I have a pen in my left hand, I do not have a pen in my right hand. And from this, we abstract the idea of to be and not to be, is and isn't. But when we consider being with a capital B, this includes not only such is-is as celestial bodies, but also such isn'ts as the space that encompasses them. And these two go together.
perfectly logical person would say that the notion of the self as the fundamental reality in which everything else exists is meaningless. And of course, from a logical point of view, it is. But at the same time, just because something cannot be put into a logical category does not indicate that it isn't real. It's saying that the self in each one of you is really at root one. Just in the same way that you have all over your body millions of nerve ends. Each one of those nerve ends is, as it were, a little eye. And it gets its impression of the world, but it sends it all back into the central brain. Well, in a somewhat similar way, every person, every animal, and even rocks are regarded as sentient beings in a very, very primitive form. So all those forms that we see may be looked upon as the eyes that look out of one central self. Only, of course, in the human body, we can see the connections between the nerve ends and the brain. It's much more difficult to see the connection between one individual and another. And therefore, it's very easy for us to form the impression that I am only what is inside my bag of skin. And that my ego, myself, is a different self from yourself. And we are all, therefore, fundamentally disconnected.
No person exists alone. And we need, in order to live, the cooperation of a community, of a society, not only of people, but also of plants, many kinds of animals, insects, bacteria, air. Every kind of thing that is around us is as essential to our being as our heads. You can draw little gradations of some things that are more essential and some things that are less essential. But fundamentally, everything is necessary for your existence.
So your apparent disconnection, the fact that you are not tied to other people with umbilical cords or some kind of uh, wiring that gives you one mind. Nevertheless, we do have one mind in the sense that, uh, for example, all of us turn out to be approximately the same shape. Two eyes, two nostrils, a mouth, two hands, two legs, and so on. But going yet deeper, we find that it's somehow a necessity of thought that there be some sort of a something which is the common ground of all these universes, all these galaxies. And that ground is the self. Now that's quite a startling point of view. Because what it's saying is, you see, that you are basically the works 